This is Peter Prine, and in this presentation, I'm going to be exploring some of the dynamics of global gender equity. An alternate title might be, What I've Learned So Far. A second purpose of this presentation is to share a way of describing dynamics of large-scale social systems to identify strategies for positive change. So in this presentation, I'm going to think about global gender equity as being the combination of political gender equity, social gender equity, and economic gender equity. And to represent that in this diagram, I'm drawing each component as a labeled circle, and then when there is a positive impact from one to another, I'm drawing a solid arrow. It's my hypothesis that global gender equity actually enhances humanity's well-being as a whole, and I hope that will become clear over the course of the presentation. Now, of course, this is a vastly complicated topic, and one place to begin in something complicated is simply where you're at. So I work as a trauma therapist, and since I know something about trauma treatment, I'm going to begin there and see where it leads. So one basic idea from a trauma field is that hurt people hurt people, and healed people are going to hurt people less. And so it's safe to say that enhancing trauma treatment in a community is going to increase trauma prevention with that community by breaking cycles of violence. And it's also safe to say that increasing the access to trauma treatment will also increase trauma treatment. So let's take a look at some other programs that can enhance trauma prevention within a community. So one is the notion of bystander intervention trainings. These are trainings that help strangers help strangers when they encounter them in distress in public. Many rape crisis counselors conduct such trainings. Another form of training that's growing in um, popularity is the notion of consent education um, in healthy relationships. So the nonprofit I Have the Right To in the United States and the Consent Collective in the UK are two examples of organizations that do this work. And then there are more comprehensive uh, curriculums around healthy relationships that often include consent. I think of the One Love Foundation's work. And then slightly more specialized, there are trainings on what is called grooming awareness. So many sexual predators employ very standard tactics to try and seduce not only their victims, but their families and even an entire community. Um, and this process is known as grooming. So by teaching parents in a school system, for example, about these um, tactics, you help prevent the abuse from happening in the first place. It's also important to emphasize the role that the arts can play in raising awareness around trauma prevention, telling stories about trauma and trauma recovery, offering choices um, to communities. The arts are a great way in to difficult conversations. So now I'd like to spend a little time talking about the relationship between trauma prevention and gender-based violence in particular. And by gender-based violence, I mean violence perpetrated by men, mostly against women, in the forms of domestic violence, rape, and incest. Now, if you think about it, if you increase trauma prevention in the community, you're going to decrease the amount of gender-based violence in the community by breaking cycles of violence. So you'll notice that the line between trauma prevention and gender-based violence is dotted, and that's to imply that it is a negative relationship. So let's explore the dynamic of this a little downstream. Based on the work of Professor Valerie Hudson and her colleagues over many decades, they have been able to prove in cultures all across the world that reducing violence in the home actually has a downstream effect of reducing violence in the community and even internationally. And the way to think about this is if men learn to get what they want through violence in the home, they take the strategy out in the communities in their interactions with other men and even other entire societies. And so what we can say is that an increase in trauma prevention decreases gender-based violence and a decrease in gender-based violence decreases international violence. When international violence is decreased, 
That is an increase in peace, so we have a dotted line there. And if you think about it, when governments are at war, which are typically groups of men fighting with each other, they are far more resistant to change under the stress of conflict. So peace creates the possibility of greater change. There's a greater opportunity for underrepresented voices to be able to be heard. And so I'm suggesting that there's a causal relationship between peace and political gender equity as well. So this is one way of thinking about the chain of um, downstream effects of reducing trauma within a community. So another piece of the puzzle that I wanted to explore were the dynamics of male allies, that is men who believe in gender equality and want to support it. First, where do male allies come from? Well, earlier we were talking about various programs to prevent um, trauma within a community. And the reality is, is that an effective consent education course, I think, produces male allies as a result. These are men who now understand the dynamics of consent, can see the disparities in the world, and are naturally positioned to help. The same is true of more comprehensive courses on healthy relationships. Another population that I've learned about are fathers with daughters. Many fathers first learn about the disparities that they experienced as a boy through the eyes of their daughters growing up in the world. Fathers can be very passionate advocates for gender equality. Another factor that I think is important to consider is the role of awareness of male privilege in culture. That is to say, when people of all genders understand that male privilege is a form of power and that there is an imbalance, then I think many of those folks naturally want to help. I think it's also important to put on the table the role of what I'm going to call emotional literacy. By that I mean the capacity to read and understand emotion, not only in others, but also ourselves. As many have pointed out, such as Tony Porter, um, men in traditional masculine societies have a very limited emotional vocabulary. And this so-called man box has horrific comp um, consequences for their own mental health as well as their relationships with others. Conversely, when men can learn to be more emotionally fluent, it helps them not only with their own mental health, but in their relationships and positions them to be better allies. And let's also add the role that the arts can play in raising awareness of these issues. I think of the British film Billy Elliot as just one example. So another piece of this landscape that I thought was important to talk about was the role that laws that further gender equity can play. And what allows those laws to be passed? Well, I think one factor is just increasing the number of women politicians. What would do that? Well, um, certainly having male allies, men who are willing to support the candidacy of female candidates. It's also incredibly important for lifelong male politicians to be willing to mentor new female candidates. And of course, another factor is going to be the number of women who vote in a community to support female candidates. At this point, it's also important to emphasize that, you know, not all women are in support of gender equality. And it would be really important within each community to understand why that is. Um, so just this one bubble, number of women who support gender equity, could be its own complex system diagram for every society and culture. Um, I think that's incredibly important to explore um, for the sake of this diagram. I just wanted to name it. So now let's take a look at just a few examples of public policy that can further gender equity. And I'm going to look at, just as an example, access to birth control, childcare equity, and menstrual equity. And let's take a look at those in their larger social context. So first, let's take a look at increasing access to birth control through public policy. It turns out if women have access to birth control, they very naturally regulate how many children they have. And if you think about that, the downstream 
effects of that are that our population as a whole is going to be more sustainable. What are the consequences of a more sustainable population? Well, what is the animal that produces more carbon over the course of their lifetime than any other? A human being. So if you have a sustainable population, you end up with a more sustainable climate. And since we have one planet with finite resources, when the population is more sustainable, we have more global resources to go around. So now let's take a look at childcare equity. I don't know a society on the planet where women are not positioned as the caretakers of children, of the elderly, of the sick. What happens if you have public policy that liberates women from being the sole caregivers, particularly of children? Well, one thing they're liberated to do is to enter the workforce. And the research is very clear. For example, the economist Linda Scott has shown that when women are allowed to enter the workforce, it has a positive impact on countries' economies. Not only that, it um, financially empowers women in their relationships with men. And when you think of women integrating into organizations, gradually over time, organizations are going to take more diverse perspectives into account. And the research is very clear that, for example, the nonprofit Catalyst has shown that diversity of perspective enhances the quality of decision making in all contexts. And you can imagine organizations over time making better decisions, enhancing not only the global economy, but humanity's well-being as a whole. And as, we're logging, as long as we're talking about enhancing diversity of perspectives in corporate decision making, if we increase the number of women politicians, that means we're also going to naturally enhance the diversity of perspectives that are included there, which will naturally enhance over time humanity's well-being as a whole, with more accurate decisions being made. So now let's take a look at menstrual equity. You can think of menstrual equity as women having equal access to period products as they would with any other health product, including having hygienic conditions to use them. Imagine a girl growing up without access to period products, having to stay home from school when she has her period. How many days of school would she miss a year? How likely would she be to drop out of school entirely? How likely would that mean that she would never enter the workforce at all, or at least at a much lower level? Access to period products makes a huge difference to being able to keep a girl's education consistent and therefore enter the workforce equitably and participate in society more generally. So. The point of taking a look at just those three examples, birth control, child care, and menstrual equity, is to show that issues that may be ghettoized as quote-unquote women's issues, when they're addressed, actually have impact on society as a whole. And of course, those are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many other social issues like child marriage that can be examined as well. So now let's take in the full landscape of what we've covered. We've taken a look at the role that trauma prevention plays in peace building. We've taken a look at where male allies come from and the positive impact they can have on the number of women politicians and laws that further gender equity. We've taken a look at just a few of the examples of how laws that further gender equity positively impact society as a whole. And it's important to note how the arts are a leverage point that cuts across all three. In social movements, arts really access everything. So from this resulting perspective of the whole, we can see the contributing factors to political gender equity, social gender equity, economic gender equity, and how they all end up contributing to global gender equity and humanity's well-being as a whole. One simple way to say this would be, if you enhance the well-being of half your species, you cannot help but enhance the well-being of the whole.